And the idea is to show you uh, how a relativistic effects are included in Vin 2K. And I will also mention a few things ab about magnetism, in particular the way to calculate the magnetic coupling and the magnetic anisotropy. You will have few slides at the end of my talk that I will not discuss and are related to the fact that you can do non-collinear magnetic calculation using the Vin NCM code developed by Robert Laskowski. So, these slides have been constructed based on the slides of all of these people. So, Robert, Stefan, Peter, and Georg Madsen. I have also used uh, the document that has been generated by Pavel Novak. Uh, and also um, um, the one for uh, Robert uh, related to the non-collinear magnetic properties and all of these books and some web pages that perhaps are not anymore available. So, uh, just to start, I see nothing. Um, yeah. <coughs> no, it should be okay, yeah. Um, light, as you know, is composed of photons and you have no mass. If you look at light, you have a speed which is a constant value and if you express the speed of light, yeah, it's better. Uh, in atomic units, you will obtain this number, which is 137 atomic units. If now you look at matter, which is composed of atoms, so you have a massive object, you will have this relation, which mentioned that the speed of, of matter is a function of mass, but the mass is also a function of speed. A way to uh, describe these relativistic effects is to use this Lorentz factor. And this Lorentz factor is simply a value in which you see you have this ratio which gives you a, a, a relation between the speed of the matter and the speed of light. If this ratio is different to one, then you will have a relativistic particle with a rel relativistic mass that will be increased compared to the rest mass. And as a consequence, the energy will change and you will have this famous formula which says that the energy is mc squared, where m is not the rest mass, but the relativistic mass. You can also see that we can express the energy in this way that will be quite useful when we look at the Dirac operator. So, let's look at very simple things. If you look at this Lorentz factor, so you have this gamma value, as soon as you are higher than one, you have a relativistic particle, and you look at the periodic table, so with here the Z number. <coughs> so what you see is for hydrogen, the relativistic uh, Lorentz factor is nearly one. In fact, it is 1.0003. So you can say, okay, there is no relativistic effect in hydrogen. And as you know, this is not true. If you look at very specific properties, spectroscopies, you will have relativistic effect also for hydrogen. If you look at gold, so the Z number is 79, and you see that it will lead to a Lorentz factor of 1.22. So you are here on the curve. And if you, uh, there is problems in my slides. <laughs> Something is missing. Um, ah, ah, ah. So if you look at this lambda factor, 1.22, it will lead to a, a relativistic mass that will be uh, the Lorentz factor times the rest mass. So you will have an increase of mass of 22% for the 1 Hz electron of gold. So if you think about that, the 1 Hz electron of gold is so close to the nucleus, it is a very fast electron, and then you have an increase of mass of 22%, which is huge. If you try to uh, differentiate the different relativistic effects, you can have four different classes. The first one is the mass velocity correction, which is related to this, uh, uh, the speed of your particle and the fact that you will have an increase of mass. Uh, the Darwin term, okay, so nothing will work. <laughs> <laughs> So the, partic the particle should do blah, 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 like that. So uh, which is, uh, there is no classical relativistic analog. And in German, you say Zitter Bewegung, which means that, <laughs> which means that, uh, in fact, the particle uh, is moving in an erratic way uh, at the speed of light. And these interferences between positive and negative energy states, so we will see that after, lead to this Darwin term, which is a relativistic effect that we have to take into account and is taken into account in Vin2K. The spin-orbit coupling, 
which is an effect that you will have, uh, and which simply says that you have a coupling between the second uh, quantum number, L, and the spin quantum number, S. Uh, so the two magnetic moments discuss each other. And you have indirect relativistic effects, which are then uh, related to this valence electron, which are really slow. But due to orthogonality, they will feel the effect of uh, the relativistic electron, which are close to the nucleus. So if you express the one electron uh, radial Schrodinger equations, <coughs> you can do it using RT atomic units or international units. And I just show both, because usually when you do physics, you always write the equation in this way, and you see that something is missing. You don't see the mass, because the rest mass of the electron in atomic units is one. And when you do relativistic effect, you need to know where is the mass. So here will be uh, the place where the relativistic effect will take place. If you express this equation using a spherical symmetric potential, which is expressed here, so very simple potential, you can decompose the wave function in a radial function and angular function, and you obtain the two following equations. So in are three atomic units and in international units. And what you see is that the mass of the electron will appear in two different terms. And this will be the place where you will have relativistic effect related to the increase of mass. Uh, looking at this uh, relativistic equation based on the Dirac Hamiltonian, you obtain the following Hamiltonian in which you see a relation between the speed of light, the momentum, I should do that way. Uh, you have also this mc square and the electrostatic potential. And what you see is that if you do uh, squ um, this Hamiltonian square, you will find again p square c square times m squ uh, mass uh, square c4, exponent 4. So you really see the relation between this classical analog and the uh, Dirac equation. And in this equation, the Pauli spin matrices will be taken into account in this term. So using this equation, uh, you can uh, express the wave function of a one particle uh, system with uh, spin half particles uh, using this four uh, component single particle wave function. The two, uh, these two terms will be uh, the large component terms that will be related to the particle and the small component terms that will be related to the antiparticle. And you see that this term is larger than this one by a factor of mc squared. So uh, if you consider this equation and if you uh, solve it, it leads to two coupled equations that are given here. And you see that you will have the small, part, uh, small component and the large component that will be related in this way. So what happens if you do uh, you solve this equation for a free particle, meaning that you, do, you have no electrostatic potential? You obtain this matrix in which you see that in the diagonal you have terms which are quite easy to see because it, you have this energy which is mc squared with plus and minus values, and you have off-diagonal terms. If you want to solve it, you do. Uh, uh, you consider the slow particle limit. They are so slow that they do not move. The momentum is zero. And in this case, all the off-diagonal terms disappear, and you just have this diagonal, leading to a separation between the particle and the antiparticle. Particle which will have up and down spin in the large component of this wave function, and the antiparticle that will have up and down spin in the small component part of the wave function. Um, if now you express this Hamiltonian, but not in, uh, for the free particle, but for a particle which is in the spherical potential, you will have the possibility to express the large component and the small component based on a product of a radial function and angular function, so for the large component and the small component. And we will have to use uh, quantum numbers which are uh, used which can be used for uh, relativistic effect. So uh, L and S are not anymore the good quantum number. 
you have to use the relativistic quantum numbers that for chemists will be J and for physicists will be kappa. And they are interrelated. Um, <clears throat> so here I will show you the expression of this Dirac equation for this spherical potential uh, situation. Uh, to do so, we will use an expression for the energy that take into account this uh, relation between the energy of the single particle and this mc square uh, correction. And we will not use the rest mass, but we will use a radially varying mass, which allows to take into account the relativistic effect. Doing so, you obtain the following equations. So what you see is that it is a Schrodinger-like equation. Uh, in which you have three different terms. So you have the mass velocity effect. So if you look at this equation, it really looks like the one electron radial Schrodinger equation in the spherical potential. So here there is no relativistic effect. It was the equation I showed you before. And you see that they are exactly the same, except that now it is not anymore the rest mass, which is here, but it is this radially varying mass. So you have relativistic effect. You have the Darwin term, which is this very special term due to this erratic movement of the electron at the speed of light. And you have the spin orbit coupling. In fact, you see that we have kappa, which appear here, and that will take into account the coupling between the orbital uh, moment and the spin moment. So you can solve this radial function in such a way to obtain uh, the, wave uh, the wave function. Yeah? I do it. <coughs> Is there no Say it again. I mean, contraction. So the orbital contra tra contraction will be there. This is what you want to say? I mean, in left theory, we have the contraction, which is Yeah. So, so if I really understand what you mean, uh, as uh, when you are looking at this uh, radial contraction, it is a way to consider the mass velocity increase, the, the mass increase. As soon as the, the mass of the particle increase, you have an orbital contraction. Okay? So this effect is taken into account here. You will have this uh, contraction. So you can, you can express it on the mass or on, on the radius. It is the same. You have to choose. Okay? I will have example just before, uh, after, you will see. Oh, and perhaps you can rediscuss that. I think the law is compaction. It's the size of the object that is apparently speed that is elected and pointed back. So that length of compaction you don't have due to the mass of the field of the object. Okay, so it's a classical echo. We cannot do that for an electron. Um, so, uh, I just want to check that, yeah. So, in fact, because we are taking into account the spin orbit coupling, I was mentioning that before, you cannot use anymore the spin and the orbital moment. There are not anymore the good numbers to describe the wave function, and then you have to use this relativistic number, so J or kappa, as you want. Yeah, important to mention that at this stage, we don't do any approximation. If your system has a spherical potential, this is the exact solution. Uh, if now you want to do a calculation, you can do a scalar relativistic calculation. This is what you do by default in Vin2K. And this scalar relativistic is simply the fact that you use all the terms except the spin orbit coupling. So you see that now this radial equation, you have everything, but we have removed the spin orbit coupling. And then you will obtain uh, an approximate radial function for the large component of the wave function and for the small component of the wave function. So this tilde is just to say that we do this approximation. And it is important to mention that, in fact, we are doing the calculation for this large component and the small component just enter in the calculation for the normalization condition. So, um, by doing so, you obtain this for component wave function, large and small component, with these radial functions, which are approximate, and the uh, angular functions. And if you want to include the spin orbit, you can do it in a second directional way. <laughs> so this is what we will show just after. 
and in, by doing so, you will include the spin orbit for a new basis set that will be defined by these solutions. And the spin orbit coupling will be defined by this matrix in which you see the spin orbit interaction. Uh, so, in VIN2K, uh, just before saying VIN2K, why this uh, approach taking into account the uh, spherical potential is um, a good approximation? In fact, relativistic effects are mainly inside the, the core of the atom. And if you look at the, the, the part which is close to the nucleus, the potential is clearly spherical. So for that reason, when you include the relativistic effect uh, in quantum mechanics, you can simply implement it inside these atoms and the spherical potential, so the muffin-tin approximation is well suited. So in VIN2K, here is the way relativistic effects are treated. You have a treatment that is for the core electrons. In this case, we have a, full, a fully relativistic treatment using the spin compensated Dirac equation. And for the valence electron, we will use the scalar relativistic uh, equation, meaning that you have the mass velocity, the Darwin term, but not the spin orbit coupling. And if you want to include the spin orbit coupling, you should do it after. For the interstitial region, you have nothing. So the interstitial electrons, which are far from the nucleus, so they are really slow, they do not feel such a relativistic effect. These valence electrons are not treated in a relativistic way. Okay? So whatever you do, they will have no relativistic treatment for these uh, interstitial electrons. If you uh, look at the core states for which you do uh, Dirac equation, you will have to. Um, so yeah, sorry. You have to look at the input file of the core state, so E, I, N, C. And then you obtain such an input file in VIN2K. So you already use it to put a core hole in spectroscopy. So it was X-ray spectroscopy. So what you see here is the principal quantum number, the relativistic quantum number, kappa, and the occupation. So you have this table which is provided in the VIN2K user guide. And if you look in more details, what you simply see is that you will have the different electrons. Here it's for gold. So one half. 1 has 1 half, 2 has 1 half, P 1 half and 3 and half for the 2P state and so on. So here you see how many core states must be taken into account for gold and that will be treated in a fully relativistic manner. Uh, for the valence electrons, by default you are scalar relativistic and in fact it is simply mentioned in the structure file in which you have this calc equal rela meaning that you are taking, taken into account um, mass velocity and Darwin uh, corrections. If you don't want to do a relativistic calculation, which is not something that you have to do, but sometimes you do it, you have to change that and to put a non-rela, I don't remember, no-rela? NREL, NREL. And then you will be, do a non-relativistic calculation. But you see, will see that it is really dangerous to do that. So, yeah, nothing more to say. Uh, you can read that data perhaps after. And don't forget that balanced electrons, which are in the interstitial region, will be treated in a classical manner. So, spin orbit coupling. Imagine that now you have an, a system for which you have to include the spin orbit effect. Uh, you will do a calculation in two steps. The first step will be to do a first diagonization using LAPW1 code, in which you will have, you will obtain the uh, wave uh, vector and uh, the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. These eigenfunctions of LAPW1 will be used as a basis set of uh, your spin orbit uh, calculation using this LAPSO uh, code. And by doing so, you will obtain this correction taking into account the coupling between the spin and the orbit. So it is mentioned here. The, the good point is that the basis set for the spin orbit calculation will be smaller than the basis set for the LAPW1 calculation. Um, so it will be inside the muffin tin sphere. So if you have chosen very bad muffin tin sphere, you will have a bad treatment of this uh, spin orbit coupling. You have to choose it carefully. Um, your eigenstate 
will not be related to the spin, but to kappa, to the relativistic quantum number. So you cannot separate any more spin up and spin down. And in this calculation, we ignore the off-diagonal terms uh, of the matrix, uh, which means that we will have to do this spin orbit calculation for a given magnetization direction. So we have to choose in which direction we uh, do this spin orbit coupling. So it can be uh, a bad point, but you will see that to do magnetic anisotropy is really useful because then we can see how the magnetization direction is changing. That's it. Uh, so how it looks like? So it's really easy to do uh, spin orbit calculation in VIN2K because VIN2K helps you. First of all, you can do a regular scalar relativistic calculation as you do. And then you save your calculation using save LAPW. And then you can use this script, which is initeso underscore LAPW, which will um, explain to you how to generate the different input files. Uh, one of the major input files is this INSO, which is the input file for the spin orbit coupling calculation, in which you have few lines which are really important. This one which is the magnetization uh, direction. So you decide that you will do the spin orbit coupling ca calculation taking into account uh, the magnetization along the z-axis of your material. And then you can specify if you want to include the spin orbit coupling for all the atoms or for only few atoms. And you can also specify if you want to include the local orbitals. So uh, I will explain that after uh, for some uh, atoms. So usually when you do a spin orbit calculation, the first point is to increase Emacs in the input one file. So when you do LAPW1, you recalculate your, uh, uh, your, yeah, you recalculate your eigenvectors and eigenvalues for a larger energy range. And then after you use them as a basis set for this uh, LAPWSO calculation. And it is easy to run. Instead of doing run underscore LAPW, you do run underscore LAPW minus SO. And if you are in spin polarized case, you just have to include this. So if you do a spin orbit calculation with, uh, for um, a system which is not spin polarized, and you just do init SO, uh, Vin2Web will just open this very small uh, window. And you just have to click and to uh, to do what is mentioned, increasing max. And so <coughs> if you do a calculation for a system which is already spin polarized, you have done run sp underscore lapw. Vin2Web will include more options. And one of the very important options uh, is the one for which you will search the symmetry related to your system. Because the fact that you put uh, your calculation for a given magnetization axis will reduce the symmetry. So just to illustrate, uh, if you do a spin, uh, no, if you do a relativistic calculation for beryllium, so an, an atom that contains only four, uh, four electrons, so it's very, if you calculate the Lorentz factor, it will be nearly one. So no relativistic effect. Here it is a non-relativistic calculation. You have the total energy as a function of the volume. And you see that the experimental volume is here. It is a local, so local density approximation, LDA. So we underestimate the volume as expected. If now you do a scalar relativistic calculation, so you include the relativistic effect except the spin orbit, you see that we have nearly the same volume from our DFT calculation, and you just have a change of energy, which is something that we expect. There is no reason to have the same. So uh, the two curves have nearly the same curvature which, in fact, can be easily uh, found looking at the bulk modulus, which will be, for the non-relativistic and scalar relativistic, nearly the same, and in good agreement with experiments. So for beryllium, doing non-relativistic calculation is not a bad point. If now you do the same for osmium, in which Z is 76, so you will have mass velocity correction, and relativistic effects are expected to be strong. You see that if you do a non-relativistic calculation, you obtain a volume for your DFT calculation, which is larger than the experiment and using LDA. So you do not expect that with LDA. You expect something that would be in the other way. Uh, 
If now you do a scalar relativistic calculation, so you include the mass velocity and the Darwin term, you see that now the volume you obtain is closer to the experiment and is uh, slightly underestimated. So this is clearly a huge effect which is just due to the fact that you have uh, a nucleus that will lead to very fast electrons nearby the nucleus. And what you see is that the bulk modulus, which gives you an information about this curvature, goes from 344 to 447. So you have a better agreement with the experiments when you include the scalar relativistic treatment. What happens if now we include the spin orbit coupling? If we include the spin orbit coupling, you see that the curve is a little bit better. So you see that now our volume is really close to the experiment. But you do not have so much difference. The bulk modulus does not change so much. So if I, I don't know where, where is this, yeah. It's just from here to here. And you see that compared to the effect from non-relativistic to scalar relativistic, scalar relativistic to spin orbit does not change too much. So this is what we expect. The question about bulk modulus. When you say experimental bulk modulus, 462, is that measured at absolute zero or something like that? What do you mean? Well, when you calculate bulk modulus. Because when we, we, we are using the Birman argam Equation? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But then you don't really expect it. The, the modification for such methods should be not large. Of course. Let's say one, 100 gigapascal of change is huge. Okay. You see 100 yeah, gigapascal. Okay. The question about what modules that are yeah. relatively yeah. yeah. I cannot answer to this question, to be honest. OK. Uh, Let's now illustrate with figures uh, these two effects. The mass velocity correction, which is simply the fact that your electron is so close to the nucleus that it is really fast, and then you will have this mass increase. And indirect relativistic effect. So for electrons which are really slow, but that will feel the relativity. So here <coughs> is the picture I, sh uh, I showed you briefly uh, just before. So you have gold atom, Z is equal to 79, and I just use the Bohr model. And if you use the Bohr model, you know that A0 is H bar divided by rest mass C alpha, and it will give you one Bohr. So this uh, one Bohr, uh, sorry, I just have to check what I say, yeah? And if you uh, calculate the, uh, the distance between the nucleus and the one Hess electron of gold, it will be 1 divided by 79, and this will give you 0.013 Bohr, which is this value. If now you do a non-relativistic calculation using Gin 2K, and you draw the, uh, radial, uh, the radial function square, so the density, you see that the maximum, uh, the radial, radial density, sorry, you see that the maximum is exactly at the same position than the Bohr model. So it's, you know, this is something that we all, all know. Although the Bohr model is not exact, because there is an approximation in the way they treat the, the quantum effect, they find, we find exactly the good position compared to the maximum of this function. Uh, if now you do a relativistic treatment, so you will do it to, in two ways. We change the Bohr model, including the relativistic effect, and we do also it. Uh, we do that also for uh, the DFT calculation. So, when you do relativistic treatment in the Bohr model, you have to change this rest mass by the relativistic mass. So I put the relativistic mass, and if you do so, A0 is not anymore one Bohr. It will be one Bohr divided by the Lorentz factor. Okay, and the Lorentz factor was 1.22 for gold. And by doing so, you will obtain uh, so 1 divided by 79 times 1.22, and it will give you this value, which is 0.01 Bohr. So you see that you go from this non-relativistic Bohr model to this relativistic Bohr model. We change the position. You have an orbital contraction. If you do the same now, doing a relativistic calculation, so scalar relativistic calculation with Vin 2K, you see that your maximum is also changing and corresponds to the Bohr model. So this is simply an orbital contraction because this one has electron around the gold 
nucleus is so fast that it will go in this way. You have some, uh, some pretty, uh, uh, yeah, you have to, uh, to fight against this, uh, this, uh, this effect. Yeah? Yeah. It's gold. And I, I is what the because I'm looking at the one S electron. I'm looking at the one S electron of gold. So I do a very crude approximation. This is an hydrogen like uh, picture. Okay? And I just look at how it will behave due to the fact that this electron is really fast. I so just how much is the velocity of this uh, it is um, uh, the velocity of this electron will be, in yeah, fact, slides before. Uh, yeah. Sixty <laughs> <laughs> No, no, but uh, this electron will be really fast. It will be not far from the velocity of light. I don't remember exactly the value, but the fact that you have twenty percent of uh, of uh, mass enhancement is clearly an indication that you are really fast. You are close to the velocity of light. And simply because there are 79 protons which are attracting you. And the only way to fight against that is to be fast. <sighs> you, have to, you have to find a way to avoid this attraction. Okay? So, let's continue. <laughs> let's see. Now let's do the same for the 6S electron. So, 1S, 2S, 3S, 4S, 5S, 6S electrons. This one are really slow. Amazingly slow, okay, compared to the one has electron of gold. So we do not expect relativistic uh, corrections. And in fact, if you calculate the Lorentz factor for this 6x, 6s electron of gold, you obtain this value. So you obtain an enhancement of mass of 0.46 percent. Nearly nothing. So you do not expect what I show here. You do not expect that when you do a non-relativistic calculation in V2K and a relativistic calculation in V2K, you do not expect such a huge orbital contraction. Because what you see with this curve is that the maximum of your density, electron density, uh, radial density, has been changed a lot. And in fact, it is more than 20% of contraction. So how can you explain that? Because this electron is really slow. In fact, it's quite easy to explain. You should never forget that this orbital is, uh, has an orthogonal relation with this orbital, the 1s orbital. And if the 1s orbital contracts, then the screening here will change, and all the orbitals will follow this orbital. So here is the idea. If you calculate the relativistic um, energy of your uh, orbital minus the non-relativistic energy divided by the non-relativistic energy for each orbital. Uh, you see that for the 1s orbital, you have uh, an effect of the relativity which is about minus 10 percent. So meaning that uh, you, you uh, stabilize your 1s orbital by more than 10 percent. If you look at the 6s orbital, which is non-relativistic in the sense of the speed of uh, the, the electron, you see that you have a correction for the energy which is 40%. This is huge. And you see how the orthogonality of this orbital will play. Uh, explaining why the 6s orbitals are so much uh, impact by the relativistic treatment. So when you do scalar relativistic calculations, you treat properly the core states, and by treating properly the core states, and by orthogonality condition, you will have a good treatment of the 6s orbital, thus of your valence electrons, okay? Without doing spin orbit. But if you do not do scalar relativistic calculations, this will not be correctly described, okay? Uh, ah. <laughs> it's a pity. 
sorry. I just want to check something. So, uh, the idea is to say, after 30 minutes, you are completely dead. So let's do something else. So we will travel in space and in time, going from Hamilton to Tarragona. So I'm French, OK? I'm not from Spain. But Tarragona is a beautiful place. Uh, in fact, it is not far from France, from Corsica, which are beautiful places. And you can see that you are in this Mediterranean Sea. So it's a beautiful place. You have to go there. Uh, and yeah, let's see if we can do some relativistic treatment of the quantum physics in this Tarragona place. So, OK, you have beach, you have a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Europe. Europe is beautiful. OK. Uh, and in fact, if you go to Tarragona, uh, you have this festival, which is Santa Tecla Festival. And sometimes these people are doing very, very dangerous things. They are doing human pyramid. And you see how much this pyramid could go. So it's amazing. And you have the crowd, which is here. So imagine that something happened, it would be really dangerous. And yeah, when I saw this pyramid, I had the feeling that it was like orbitals, say. <laughs> One S, two S, three S, four S, five S, six S. OK? So the core is here. And the idea was to say, what will happen, because we are in Spain, if something like that <laughs> right. okay. So the idea is very simple. To have relativistic effect, you need mass. Okay? And you need speed. Something like that. And you need a direct impact. So for sure, these 1s electrons, these guys, will feel what will happen here. So the perturbation will be really strong. But what will happen to this one? Okay? Because he will not feel it directly. But for sure, it will have a very strong impact. This is what I named orthogonality conditions. Okay? You can feel it. <laughs> so, and there is something else. Remember that hydrogen atom is not relativistic in our point of view if we look at Lorentz factor. But, okay, if this small animal comes and you have some people that are afraid by these small animals, the crowd will move. This will move and it will feel some balance that will be this relativistic effect due to a small mass object. Okay? So here is my idea of relativistic effect. OK. So it was just an interlude. <laughs> so redo some PDF file. So nya, nya, nya. How can you do it? View. Control L. So it was for S orbitals, the easiest one. Now what happens if you do relativistic treatment of P orbitals? And here what I show uh, is the 5p orbitals of gold in a non-relativistic way. So here you still have your different maximum. In fact, you have 5p, so you expect four nodes. So this will be uh, one, two, three, uh, you expect, yeah, four nodes. Five, yes, I something curious. Three nodes. You expect three nodes. Yes, you expect three nodes. OK, I should say it again. You expect three nodes, uh, and you have the maximum, which is here. Let's do relativistic calculation for kappa equal minus 2, which for a chemist would be j equals 3.5. So in this case, you see that nearly nothing happened. The non-relativistic function and the relativistic function are exactly the same. So no, no modification. This j 3.5 corresponds to the coupling between orbital moment and spin moment, which are in the same direction. If now you do j equal 1 and half, so kappa equal 1, you see that you have a very strong effect. So the relativistic effect for kappa equal 1 is really important compared to kappa equal minus 2. And in this case, so you have opposite direction for the moments. So here is a summary. This one will not feel so much difference with non-relativistic calculation, and this one will feel it. It is for that reason that in VIN2K, if you want to treat properly uh, these orbitals, which are j equal one and half, you have to include local orbitals. Because naturally, you do not have these wave functions in your basis set. So you have to include it if you want to be faster in the convergence. So if you look at this using these diagrams that give you the relativistic correction as a function of the orbitals, you see what will happen. For the uh, P3 n which are in a way non-relativistic, because they don't feel so much difference, you see that the correction is very small. Nearly nothing happens. 
For the p orbitals, which are p1 and half, for which we see that there is a very strong contraction, you see that you have like s orbitals, you have a very strong variation. Okay? And one more time, this orbital will have some relativistic mass enhancement. This one for sure not. But by orthogonality, you will have this effect. Uh, one more impact. If now you look at d orbitals, so d orbitals are different to the other ones for the following reason. There, are, there is no d orbital which are close to the nucleus. So you cannot have mass enhancement for these d orbitals. But the d orbitals are so far that they will feel everything happening nearby the core states. So in fact, what will happen is that the shielding will play a role uh, on these uh, orbitals. So here is the treatment of the d orbitals in a non-relativistic way. You can do Slater model which was a beautiful model that we still teach uh, in France, for instance, so to our students. We simply say that a way to describe this D state, or F state, whatever you want, so valence states, is to consider that all the inner electrons are treated effectively as an effective nucleus. And you simply say that it is the shielding of the interaction between the electron and the nucleus. And then it's one particle uh, Hamiltonian. If now you do that in a relativistic way, in a relativistic way, what happens? The inner electrons feel an orbital contraction because they are close to the nucleus and they have to fight against uh, the, the charge of the nucleus. So this, there is this orbital contraction. Because you have an orbital contraction, it means that the shielding is larger. And because the shielding is larger, the effective charge of the nucleus is smaller. And then the attraction with the outside electrons will be less. So the orbital will increase. OK? You understand that? So for S and P orbitals, we feel an orbital contraction. For D and F electrons, we will feel an orbital expansion, simply due to this screening. And in fact, Hopefully, this is what happened. If you do uh, these states, what you see is that now the relativistic correction leads to a destabilization. So you have an increase of energy so because you have an orbital expansion. And what you see is that for three and a half, nearly nothing happened. But for five and uh, over two, so J equals five over two, you have this increase. OK? So it's indirect effect related to the core states which feel this scalar relativistic uh, treatment. So here is the scheme that show everything. S orbitals and P orbitals, <coughs> D and F orbitals. And what you see is that when you have P one and half, so when, when you have J equal one and half, you have a given behavior. When J is equal to three and a half, nearly nothing happens. And when J is larger, so 5 over 2 and 7 over 2, you have this destabilization. Okay, so J is a parameter, is a quantum number that will decide how the um, relativistic treatment will change <coughs> the orbitals. I just removed that. <laughs> uh, so, if you summarize for gold atom, here you have the different effects. So for S and P orbitals, you have a stabilization due to the fact that the orbital is contracted by relativistic effect, scalar relativistic effect. You have orbital expansion for the D states. And then after, you can include the spin orbit splitting that will lift the degeneracy for the different uh, J values. This relativistic gold atom, if you put it in the materials, will have this yellowish color. That will not be the case if you do it in a non-relativistic manner. And this can be observed if you simply do an optical calculation for gold. Uh, looking at, so look at this one. It's epsilon 2, so it's imaginary part of the dielectric function, which leads to the absorption as a function of energy. If you do a non-relativistic calculation, you see that you do not absorb in the visible light. So gold is white if you do a non-relativistic calculation. And if you do a scalar relativistic calculation, you have absorption in the visible light. And you see that the spin orbit coupling 
correction is very small, it will simply change something in this region. So to have yellow gold, you should include the relativistic effect. Or you, are, you will have white gold. It is the same for silver. You will have different effects. You see that to have absorption in the visible light, you need to have this relativistic effect. So, uh, local orbitals. As I was saying to you, we are doing LAPW1. So, LAPW1 will give you uh, your wave function. And this will be used as the basis set of your spin orbit calculation. But in this non uh, yeah, in this function, you do not have the p one half uh, function. So, if you want to do your calculation in a more efficient way, you should input these p one half uh, orbitals in your calculation using local orbitals. It should be done with care. So usually we do. I don't do it, but some people are doing it. So Peter Baha, for instance, Alliance, Robert, and here in this paper, what you see is the convergence as a function of the basis set. So you have more and more basis set, and what happens if you do not include the p one half orbitals? So you see that your energy is better and better, but never really converge. And if you include these p one half orbitals, you will have a better convergence of your system. And what you see is, in fact, the position of this p1 half in the density of states. So without taking into account the local orbitals and taking it into account. So you see that you have a strong energy difference, 6.2 here, 7.5 here. So because, in fact, they are not included in this calculation. So it's really difficult to describe something if you don't have the good basis set. More details ask to. Uh, expert. Um, as I was saying, we are doing spin orbit calculation using the second variational, and we do not take into account the off diagonal terms, so we have to uh, uh, put, use a magnetization axis, and it will have a strong consequence on the symmetry of your system. So, in 2K, in, when you are using init SO, we'll find the new symmetry related to the magnetization axis and will propose to you a new setting. So if you have to do that, if you do, don't do that carefully, you will do a, a stupid calculation because the symmetry will be dependent on that. So here is the table which gives you the relation between the different uh, symmetry uh, axis and mirrors and how it impacts on the spin. Um, here is the summary. So I think that I have nothing to say. Just you can look at this again uh, when you have time, but just to explain how we are doing the calculation in a non-relativistic <laughs> way, in a scalar relativistic, fully relativistic. Don't forget that interstitial region does not have any relativistic effect, and so on. Let's now have a few minutes for the last part, uh, which is magnetic coupling, and uh, 10 minutes, and magnetic anisotropy. Um, so, yes, yeah, there is no relativistic effect. But Caroline was showing to you uh, during the first day that we can do this magnetic calculation for ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic systems. As soon as you have long-range magnetic order, you have a coupling between the different atoms. And this magnetic coupling, the J value, can be described easily using an Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So here is the given Heisenberg Hamiltonian. You have your Hamiltonian of your system in which you have a spin independent part. In fact, you, have, you don't have the long range order. And this part will describe the long range order of your material with two spins for two different uh, magnetic centers. By convention, if G, this J value is positive, it will be anti-ferromagnetic coupling. If J value is negative, it will be ferromagnetic. If you find a minus sign here, the convention will be reversed. So. Uh, if you express the energy for such an Hamiltonian, you obtain the total energy with this part, which is not related to the long range order, and this part, which is related to the long range order. S square, the spin of the magnetic center. So if you have spin half, it will be one half times one half. It will give you one over four. The magnetic coupling, and if you are up and up, so ferromagnetic, you will have one times one. 
Oh, I will show you that. Let's take a very simple example. The spin half dimer. So you just have two atoms. And you have no periodic condition. We are not doing even 2K calculation. We are just looking at this very simple model. And we look at this model for which we know that we have a coupling, magnetic coupling between the two atoms. To extract the J value, we will do what we named a mapping analysis. Mapping analysis is simply the idea that we are using the broken symmetry. And we do a calculation for a ferromagnetic situation and an antiferromagnetic situation. When it is black, it is spin up. When it is white, it is spin down. So I do this dimer in a ferromagnetic relation, and I do a second calculation for an antiferromagnetic situation. I obtain the total energy for both situations, which will be uh, independent terms of the long range order plus the long range order. Here I obtain the following relation because, because here it's spin half, so I have. 1 half times 1 half, it gives you 1 over 4. And because you have plus 1 plus 1, you have J12. Okay? You do the same for the antiferromagnetic situations. You remove this plus. So it gives you E0 minus 1 over 4 J. And then if you do the energy difference between ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic, you will obtain 1 over 2 of this uh, J12, which in fact will give you the J value is two times the energy difference. So by two, doing two calculations, you obtain the <coughs> magnetic coupling. It was for a molecule. Now what happens if you do that for a solid? And you can do that after if you want during the exercise. So I, I took the example of nickel oxide, which has this rock salt structure. You have already done that during the exercise. You use this A-type antiferromagnetic structure, which is in fact you have an alternation of uh, planes along the uh, diagonal of the cube. So if you use the rhomboidral unit cell, for a ferromagnetic situation, you are like that. So all the spins are the same in blue. And if you do the antiferromagnetic situation, spin down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay? You can express the energies of these two calculations using this Heisenberg Hamiltonian. If you look locally what is happening for this nickel atom, you see that nickel is surrounded by six copper having opposite spin site, size, uh, sign. And the coupling will be a super exchange coupling between nickel, oxygen, nickel with an angle of 180 degrees, which means that you expect antiferromagnetic coupling due to the kanamori goodenough rules. And if you count how many J values you have in the unit cell, you have 12, but in this unit cell, you have, um, you have, I don't remember, uh, you have six, yeah, you have six nickel atoms, so you should divide by six, and then you have two J values per unit cell, okay? You express the energies for these two systems, energies that I express per formula unit, so for one nickel oxygen formula unit, it will give you E0 plus 2J, because the 2J values are ferromagnetic, and E0 minus 2J, because the J values are all antiferromagnetic. You do your mapping, and it will give you J equal energy difference between these two calculations divided by 4. Okay? I hope I'm not too fast. For sure I'm fast. That's yeah, okay. <laughs> Escape, why is escape? I escape. Yeah. So I just show you the results. I, I hope it will work. Yeah. So yeah, my connection is okay with not. So if I go to this nickel oxide, you see it? Yeah. Uh, I did one calculation for the ferromagnetic situation. And here I obtain okay, let's show first the antiferromagnetic calculation. You did it. So I do grep uh, of the energy in the def file, just to check that my calculation is converged. Um, I can show you that I did a, a GGA plus U calculation using um, the parameters that was defined uh, for the exercise. 
So I have two nickel atoms and I put this 0.52 which is about 7 EV. So you are doing PBE, so GGA PBE plus uh, uh, Hubert term of 7 EV. The structure is the one you have used in the exercise in which you have this rhomboidral lattice parameter, two different nickels. I just remind you that if you don't put the labels, Vin2K will propose to you a smaller uh, a unit cell that will give you only one in equivalent nickel atoms and oxygen with the two position. So quarter, 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 and minus quarter, minus quarter, minus quarter. Okay. If now I do grep of the energy, not in the day file, but in the SCF file, I obtain this energy for the antiferromagnetic calculation. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Uh, copy. I will use Excel. Ah, I will use Excel if I, I can do it. And then I do the same. Okay, I can show you the magnetic moment. So for people that did it, you should obtain mine, uh, 72, uh, something like 1.72. Ah. Yeah, oh, 76. Okay, so nickel 1 is up with 1.76, and nickel 2 is down, so it's antiferromagnetic coupling with minus 1.76. And you see that oxygen, there is no magnetic moment. So you expect that because you are in this situation, you have nickel oxygen nickel in this way and you have up spin down spin so if you draw the the spin wave function it will look like that okay so you will have a node here in fact this oxygen atom is both up and down spin because it is sharing the orbital of this magnetic center and the orbital of this magnetic center when you will do a ferromagnetic calculation it will be up and up you expect a magnetic moment on oxygen. Okay, I just show that. So I just go to the ferromagnetic calculation, which is not the stable one. So we expect a larger energy in the SCF file. So blah, blah, blah. There is some warning. Okay. <laughs> I will check that after. <laughs> Warning is not errors. <laughs> so you have to learn how to use it in 2K. <laughs> I certainly I did this calculation in a fast manner. Uh, so here is the energy. Okay, the more stable one is the antiferromagnetic calculation, hopefully. Uh, yeah, magnetic moment. Uh, star dot SCF. So uh, magnetic moment is a little bit larger than before. And this is always what we expect when you do ferromagnetic calculation. And you see that now you have a non-zero magnetic moment on oxygen. Because in fact you do not have a node on your wave function. Okay? So 0.2 mu b. If now I do the J calculation, I simply have to convert this value um, this value in EV. <laughs> okay? Then if I succeed to use this keyboard, then um, I should put it in EV per formula unit. But if you look at your structure file, you have you have one nickel atom with a multiplicity of one, one nickel atom with a multiplicity of one. So the number of nickels per unit cell is two. So I have to take that into account. So I do that divided by two, <laughs> divided by two. <laughs> ah. And that. Now, now I can do an energy difference between ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic. It will be in EV. So you see that you have, uh, in terms of EV, 0.067. So you have to be really accurate in such a calculation if you want to estimate a J value, because it will be about some millivolts. And now if I use 
uh, this. Uh, I just check one more time my formula. And it was in the P, yeah, it was here. J was energy difference divided by 4. <coughs> energy difference divided by 4, or divided by 4. I multiply by 1000 in such a way to have milliv, and I obtain 16.8. The experimental value, okay, I don't have it, is 17 something, okay? And we're doing a very crude calculation. I didn't check anything. And I, I used the, the Hubbard value that was given in the exercise, okay? So you see that you can obtain a J value of 70 milliEV. Uh, my criterion for the convergence was 10 to the minus 5 EV, something like that, okay? Rydberg, sorry, Rydberg. Okay, it was just to show you that. Uh, Okay, I should stop. Uh, so, uh, just the last point, if you want to do magnetic anisotropy. Magnetic anisotropy is a relativistic effect. You have to, to take into account the spin orbit coupling. And you will have to take care of this line, the magnetization direction. So when you want to look at magnetic anisotropy, you are changing the magnetization direction and you do energy calculation for all the different magnetization directions. So here is an example. You have the magnetocrystalline anisotropy as a function of the magnetization direction. And you look at the curve how it looks like, and for the minimum value, you will have the easy axis, and here you will have hard axis. This will mean that if you look at the materials for which easy axis, for instance, is along Z, the magnetic moment will all align along the Z axis of your crystal. It's easy to, to obtain. Here is what we obtain for copper oxide. If you do this calculation for more than one hundred uh, magnetization direction, you can obtain a 3D shape. And if you look at this 3D shape, the minimum value is along the B axis. The maximum value is in this direction. Easy axis for the magnetization, hard axis. And experimentally, this compound, uh, it has been shown that the magnetic moment all align along the B axis. Okay, so DFT calculation per spin orbit, orbit allows you to describe properly this magnetic anisotropy. Last part will not be treated. You have the slides. It is VIN and CM, which allows you to do non-collinear magnetic calculation because what I was showing to you was collinear calculations. Okay, and I stop here. <laughs>